Chicago's top federal prosecutor, John Lausch, hospitalized by a mini stroke and the schism in the Republican Party over Liz Cheney's ouster in our spotlight politics. Joining us with all that and more are Heather Sharon and Paris Schutz. Welcome back, team. So, uh, as I just mentioned, we know that U.S. Attorney John Lausch was hospitalized over the weekend with a mini stroke. Heather, what do we know? Well, we know that he went to the hospital Saturday and he spent the night there before being discharged on Sunday. Now, his spokesman told me today that he was back at work on Monday and is under no medical restrictions and things are business as usual. But I think a lot of people were alarmed because he is such a playing such a prominent role in Chicago politics right now. Right, so a lot of public corruption investigations going on in his office uh, that we know of anyway. Uh, which ones is he working on, Heather? Refresh our memory. Well, he is prosecuting Alderman Ed Burke, who is facing a 14 count indictment of public corruption. He's also in charge of all sorts of different corruption investigations relating to um, House Speaker Michael Madigan, including four of his aides who were once lobbyists for ComEd. He's also indicted former Alderman Rick, Rick Munoz for, for stealing money from the Progressive Caucus, as well as Alderman Patrick Daly Thompson, who is accused of filing false tax returns. Um, and he's also in charge of prosecuting several Illinois residents who were part of the January 6th assault on the United States Capitol. So he definitely has his hands full. In Paris, we know obviously being U.S. attorney in these parts, that is a pressure cooker job. Um, and as Heather reported, he's been back at work. But, you know, could a, a health scare affect the timing of any of these cases? Absolutely not, Brandis, because most of these investigations started before his arrival on the scene as U.S. attorney. They're going to continue on after he's gone, after there is uh, a, a nominee to replace him. And after that nominee is confirmed, there's a group of prosecutors that have worked on all of these cases. It's, it's the same prosecutors on many of them, Burke, ComEd, and uh, they've been in that office for many, many years. I would imagine they're going to continue to be in that office, and that work goes on whoever's at the top. So uh, obviously the hack of the colonial pipeline that has made international news, but Chicago City Council is dealing with the fallout of a hack too. When a ransom wasn't paid, the mayor and her staff's emails were dumped on the internet in the dark web. Here is what the mayor said about commenting on the contents of those emails. We have no way of knowing whether or not those emails are in fact legitimate, they, that they have been um, put online in their um, in their original uh, form, and also, you know, somebody who committed a federal crime of stealing emails, I don't want to credit them as a credible news source. Now, Heather, let's start with what we know about what happened. How did these emails get to be um, sort of hacked and then dumped on the internet? And what is this we're hearing about a ransom? Well, what we know is that these emails were turned over from the city to law firm Jones Day, which has been tapped by the mayor to investigate everything surrounding the botched raid of Anjanette Young. She was the social worker who was left naked and handcuffed, pleading for help from the Chicago Police Department because they had raided her apartment mistakenly. These were the emails the city turned over to Jones Day that somehow ended up on the dark web. Now, the mayor said on Monday that the city had been asked to pay ransom to prevent these emails from being released. The city refused. Jones Day apparently also refused, according to the mayor. And so now all of these Inter these emails are on the internet for everybody to search through and uh, every Chicago political person has been searching their name uh, for the last several days. But I got I got to jump in and add here. I mean, there's an ethical question here for journalists. Absolutely. A and and you know, these emails, yes, this is public business. The public has a right to know about everything that's being said in these emails, but th that it was gotten from these kind of devious means, I, I think does raise an ethical quandary. Uh, and it kind of reminds one of uh, Russian operatives hacking the DNC's emails uh, back uh, four or five years ago, six years, whenever that was at this point. I, I, and I'm, I'm not sure what the right answer is here. I, I mean, it's, I think it's worth it to look at these emails and, and then FOIA, uh, for the you know, FOIA for the specifics so that they were gotten by 
you know, uh, you know, more normal means, but you know, that's and a that, lot of work a, to go yeah, through. Yeah, that's a fair point, Paris. But in the meantime, some intrepid reporters have gone digging through them and uh, discovered that there was a secret CPD or Chicago Police Department drone program. What do we know about that one? Well, that's the Sun Times reporters that went through and found that one that was on the front page of their paper today. And uh, according to that email and according to that report, uh, it's a drone program financed by uh, money from seized assets. Uh, so, you know, according to, to how the reporters in, in that story describe it, kind of off books financing for this drone uh, program. We don't know much more. What we do know is that anytime you talk about this kind of thing, it, it raises eyebrows among civil libertarians. The ACLU, you know, calling this out, saying that there's a lot of problems here. If this is being used to monitor things like protests, it calls to mind uh, years ago when the CPD used these Stingray machines to jam cell phone signals at protests. Also, you know, using biometric data to, to try and solve crimes. And maybe there is a, a, an element to these things that does help solve crimes. But, you know, CPD has to weigh uh, whether that's violating civil liberties and, and, and where, the, um, where the legality is here. And Heather, the other thing these emails may have revealed so far is that the mayor actually lobbied uh, for qualified immunity. What do we know there? Well, qualified immunity gives police officers a great deal of protection when they're accused of either misconduct or criminal actions in the line of duty. Now, there has been many proposals at the state level to change the state law that would make it easier, advocates say, to hold police officers accountable. But the police union and police advocates say that that would make it really hard for police officers to do their jobs. And, and those emails from Mayor Lightfoot reflect her public position is that officers deserve to be protected from those sort of um, claims uh, when it's not clear whether there has been misconduct or criminal activity. But this is at the heart of the debate going on right now in the United States Senate about how to reform policing in the wake of the murder of George Floyd and how to reform the Chicago Police Department um, under the watchful eye of a federal judge. Paris, how does that look politically for the mayor? Didn't she campaign as, as sort of the the criminal justice and police reformer. I can't, yeah, it doesn't look good, Brandis, and, and there's a lot of skepticism among reform advocates that she really is what she campaigned for. And remember, uh, she was appointed by Rahm Emanuel uh, to, to the police reform task force after the shooting of Laquan McDonald, and the video came out. And at the beginning, she, she didn't sound notes of reform. She sort of evolved I into that sort of position, and, and, and now you see a bit of a muddled position. So uh, moving on to national politics, the GOP ousted conservative stalwart Liz Cheney from her leadership position for continuing to say that Joe Biden won the presidential election. Take a look. We must speak the truth. Our election was not stolen and America has not failed. What happened today was sad. Uh, Liz has committed the only sin of being consistent and telling the truth. The truth is that the election was not stolen. 74 million voters were not disenfranchised. They were just outnumbered. So, Paris, what does her ouster say about the future of the GOP? Well, I think we should just look at the politics here. This is all politics, and uh, the GOP leader in the House, Kevin McCarthy, has made the calculation, and a majority of his conference members agree that uh, to win in 2022, to gain back the House, and for McCarthy to become Speaker of the House, they have to stick with Trump. Sticking with Trump means you have to uh, indulge him in his fantasies of a stolen election. So they, the Republicans have made the political calculation that that's what's best for their careers. And if you look at the state rep, uh, the, I'm sorry, the Congresswoman from New York, Elise Stefanik, who, who was very, um, very critical of Trump, uh, and, and now she's uh, saying that she, she's indulging those those you know, lies about a stolen election as well. It's increasing her fundraising. It's getting her a position in leadership. And so there's a lot of anger from someone like Adam Kinzinger, a Republican, conservative Republican. Liz Cheney's a conservative Republican that, you know, telling the truth here, a truth that's fundamental to democracy, just isn't welcome in the Republican Party anymore because the leadership has decided it's not good for their politics. 
Heather, is Kinzinger the, you know, the lone wolf here standing with Liz Cheney? Well, I don't know that he's the lone wolf, but he is certainly one of the very few wolves. Uh, he and Liz Cheney were, uh, uh, were two of only 10 Republicans in the United States House to vote to impeach Donald Trump, which means that they are very much in the minority within their own party, which of course is a minority in the House, which leaves them very vulnerable on two fronts. One, to redistricting in terms of the other seats outside of Wyoming. And, and Liz Cheney is very vulnerable to uh, a, a Trump-backed candidate ousting her from her seat as the lone representative in the United States House for Wyoming. And I think that we will be watching their fate in the 2022 election very closely for a little bit more information about where the National Republican Party is going to go in the near future. So talking a little bit about uh, former Mayor Rahm Emanuel, Ambassador Rahm, potentially, uh, sources report that President Biden may appoint, appoint uh, Emanuel as ambassador to Japan. Heather, what do we know about that and, and what could that mean? Well, it's not a done deal yet. We expect perhaps um, in the next several weeks that the president will make an announcement about a slate of ambassadors to high profile positions like Japan. And if Rahm Emanuel is picked to go to Japan, it will be a bit of a political resurrection. Uh, he lobbied very hard for President Biden to pick him as transportation secretary. He was passed over for former South Bend mayor and now transportation secretary, secretary Pete Buttigieg. And this will be seen as, as Rahm Emanuel's return to politics, uh, not at just at a national level, but an international level. However, he has to be confirmed by the United States Senate, uh, and that will no doubt draw fire from progressives uh, who see him as uh, uh, basically somebody who should no longer be in public life after his role in the investigation of the, the police murder of Laquan McDonald here and in Paris, Chicago. And Paris, why Japan? And why Rahm Emanuel for Japan? Well, can I, and I, I heard a progressive say, hey, they're okay with this because it gets Rahm Emanuel as far away from Chicago as geographically <laughs> possible. Although, as Heather said, you know, some of the, the progressive wing of that party is not, you know, not happy with Rahm Emanuel in any position. Um, he, he, he's gotten a lot of controversy among that wing of the party. But Japan's an important post. You know, let's not kid ourselves. China is the biggest geopolitical threat, according to President Biden, according to most uh, observers on the international stage. Japan is a key ally in that region. So it would make sense to have somebody that you trust uh, in that position to, to you know, maintain a very close relationship with Japan. And quickly, before I let you both go, Alderman Carrie Austin blown through, um, or she had blown through a deadline to pay a reduced ethics fine. Uh, Heather, remind us what that fine was for and how she managed to get it reduced. Well, she w she took $48,500 in improper campaign contributions from a business that had a bunch of city contracts. If you've got city contracts, you're very limited in the amount of money that you can give to candidates. Carrie Austin uh, took money that she wasn't supposed to, uh, and initially the Chicago Board of Ethics fined her three times that amount, so more than $140,000, but then they thought better of it and they reduced that fine to just $5,000. But Alderman Austin, who's the second longest serving alderman on the city council, uh, didn't pay that by the deadline of m midnight on Monday. And now the law department is charged with trying to collect that fine and to get those improper campaign contributions back. Probably not a good look for an alderman on that front. <laughs> we'll leave it there for now. Thanks to the Spotlight Politics team, Heather Sharoon in Paris Shuts.